Hi, my name is Dr. Vincent Cassiano. I'm a board-certified family medicine and pain medicine physician. I'm going to talk to you briefly about neck pain. I have no disclosures, and my objectives for this lesson is to teach you some basic anatomy of the neck and describe some of the most common conditions that I see in a pain practice uh, that you may have. Um, understand also treatment options that are available based on what conditions you have in your neck. So real basic, the anatomy of uh, neck pain is considered pain pretty much anywhere from the, where your skull starts to the base of the neck, which it goes surprisingly low, goes to what feels like in between the upper part of your shoulders. Some of the things to keep in mind is that by far and away, the most common cause of both neck and back pain is typical sprain strains, muscular pain. However, by the time a patient gets to see me in pain management, usually these things have resolved and it's something more uh, chronic at, uh, at hand. The, what you see here is something that happens uh, frequently in both the neck and back is that you may have pain somewhere in your neck, but you're actually feeling it outside of your neck. And in the neck, you have uh, both referred patterns and you can see here with the image on the left, the, based off of what level your condition is, you may have a reference to different parts of your neck, head, and shoulders. You also have radicular symptoms, which is on the image on the right, where depending on what level you have a pinched nerve, you may experience pain going down your arms. So some of the basic anatomy, and this is a lumbar model, but we'll discuss where they differentiate between lumbar and cervical, um, you have your vertebrae. In between your vertebrae, you have your discs. And those discs provide two services. One, they are shock absorbers. And two, they help create the space for your nerves to be able to exit your spine, as well as they help create the space for the facet joints, which are the major joints of both the neck and the back. If you look on the cross section, what you'll see is that the disc is largely built like a jelly donut. The center is jelly and the external part is uh, like a double layer rubber gasket that's quite firm. When it is healthy, that double layer rubber gasket compresses the jelly in the center and holds it in place. And this is what helps create that really nice firm shock absorber. As it wears out over time, the rubber part becomes thinner and the jelly has more freedom of movement and that's where you get bulging discs that can give you some discomfort. At baseline, and the evidence is better for this in the low back than the neck, but at baseline, the anterior portions, both your discs and vertebral bodies, hold about 75% of the weight. So in your neck, it would be about 75% of the weight of your head. And the facets hold about 25%. Now, you can shift this weight to make it worse by bringing your chin to your chest, which would be a forward flexion. And then that would increase the weight to about 90%. And if you wanted to decrease the weight on your anterior column, you would lean it back like you're looking at the ceiling. And that would shift the weight from the discs to the facets. So that line that just appeared essentially separates the anterior elements of the spine from the posterior elements of the spine. Anterior elements, again, being your vertebral body and your discs, and the posterior elements being your facets. One big anatomic difference between the neck and the low back is this joint here that's circled on the right, and that is called your uncovertebral joint. It's another joint that exists for about half of the vertebral bodies of the neck, and the reason it's there largely is to provide additional support for the neck because the neck has an increased range of motion over like the low back. But because it's a joint, it can be, uh, become arthritic, just like any other joint. And if it becomes arthritic, it starts to cause pain. So when we talk about anterior versus posterior column pain, anterior column pain, again, is pain arising from anything in front of, uh, in front of the uh, neuroforamen, neuro meaning nerve, foramen meaning window. And this can be either from the vertebral body itself or the discs. And the pain is typically worse with forward flexion because you're increasing how much weight is experienced on the anterior column. 
and um, it can be worse with anything that provides weight because if you were to wear a helmet the 75 percent of that weight of the helmet will be on the anterior column so typically looking down looking up or look down at a screen like your cell phone or a laptop You can see with this x-ray, as you lean forward, you reverse the curve of your neck and you really load the front part of the spine. So your anterior column, again, is made of largely your vertebral bodies, which look like marshmallows, and the discs in between them. And so for the most part, uh, anterior column pain in the neck is caused by uh, degenerating discs. And those degenerating discs can press into uh, neural structures like your spinal cord or the sac around your cord and cause significant pain. It can also be caused by vertebrogenic pain, which would be that some of the disc material uh, leaks out into the bones and causes inflammation of the bones. And for a deeper explanation of this, you can check out the other video on uh, chronic low back pain. Here's an MRI image of how the vertebral bodies change color on the MRIs depending on uh, the chronicity of the inflammation of the bones themselves. This should cause a chronic neck pain that stays in the neck that is worse with loading the anterior column with activities like looking down. For disc degeneration options, the neuropathic agents uh, tend to be the most effective for the pain that leaves your neck and goes down into your arms. These can be gabapentinoids like gabapentin or pregabalin, which are known as their trade names as Neurontin or Lyrica. Uh, they can also be tricyclic antidepressants uh, or SNRIs. Your gabapentinoids and your tricyclics um, do come with a sedation profile, and that's why folks tend to not like them. They work particularly well for nerve type pain, which is usually pain experienced in the arms coming from the neck. Uh, and they work okay for neck pain itself, but because of the complicated nature of neck pain uh, being partially caused by nerve pain and partially caused by muscle and partially caused by joints, you may only experience kind of a limited relief of the neck pain, but it does work very, very well for pain that leaves the neck and goes down the arms. Epidural steroid injections are also an option. Uh, just like the back, they're, uh, they're injected into the epidural space. They work by washing away the inflammatory uh, chemicals that are there when you have an acute inflammatory event. They drop steroid onto the area and cause a local anti-inflammatory response, which can be very helpful for nerve type pain specifically. Um, a little bit less helpful for pain in your neck that stays in your neck, but pain in your neck that goes down the arms, it tends to be quite helpful for. Um, NSAIDs uh, are less likely to work because their anti-inflammatory effect don't get down quite deep enough to the, uh, the level of the nerves and it treats a different kind of pain. It tends to not treat a nerve type pain. It tends to treat a uh, achy, dull type pain that you might have in your neck from potentially arthritis. Topical medications are less effective because they don't penetrate deep enough. In your low back, you're able to get an epidural from both an interlaminar approach, which is essentially right up the middle, as well as a transforaminal approach going through the little hole that your nerves come out. Most providers do this in the, in the back, uh, but in the neck, they tend to not provide this because it can be a little dangerous. You do have an exposed blood vessel uh, that would be uh, potentially injured during a transforaminal injection. So we tend not to do that. You'll still find some providers who can do it. And they're very skillful at doing so, but your average provider probably will not do that. So vertebrogenic pain, uh, as we discussed in the low back lecture, uh, arises because your vertebral body, uh, it, which is shaped essentially like a marshmallow, um, it is very, very hard around the edges but around the part that interfaces with the disc, it's actually very porous, kind of like a pumice stone and relatively soft compared to the rest of the bone. This is because there is no blood supply to the center of the disc and the disc gets its nutrients from the bone directly by um, diffusing across. 
And when you stress a disc, it pushes out in all planes because it's essentially fluid filled. Um, and so it pushes forward, backward, as well as into the plate above it and into the plate below it. If you are to disrupt the end plate, like you can um, with these graphics with like focal deficits or corner deficits or just eroding it over time, the jelly center of the disc is uh, very inflammatory. It's unclear at this time whether it is chemically caustic or whether it just causes an immune response. But when it causes that immune response or the inflammatory response, it is very painful to the vertebrae. And this typically, because it's anterior column, this would be pain in your neck that does not go down the arm, that um, uh, gets worse with doing things to load your anterior column, which are things like looking down at a screen, bringing your chin to your chest, stuff like that. Now, vertebrogenic pain is typically treated with NSAIDs, um, which has some efficacy. Topicals likely does not reach deep enough. Uh, epidural steroid injections typically don't work very well, or if they do work, you'll notice that the nerve that feeds the vertebral body actually comes from the epidural space. And you can see that right here. And so an epidural may give you a very transient uh, relief of your symptoms. Uh, so typically maybe a week or two, and then the symptoms come back. And so epidural steroid injections tend to be very, very helpful for pain that leaves your neck, that goes down your arms because it's caused by the disc. But pain caused by the bone itself typically does not respond well to an epidural. There is a procedure, if you uh, watch the back pain lecture called the intercept procedure, that is highly effective for vertebrogenic pain, but unfortunately it is limited to um, your lumbar spine. And so this is not something that's currently available for use in the neck. Um, the equipment is just uh, incompatible uh, at this time with using it in the neck. In the future, hopefully the company will develop um, different hardware that can be used within the neck, but at this time does not exist. So the best uh, treatment option for these patients would be uh, largely NSAIDs and physical therapy. Okay, so now we're going to talk about posterior column pain. And so this is pain, again, of, of posterior elements, which is going to be largely your facet joints. And in this case, we're going to kind of lump your uncovertebral joints into that as well. Although technically your uncovertebral joints are part of the anterior column. Functionally, however, they kind of behave like posterior column elements. So these are going to be pain worse with extension as you shift the weight off of your disc and onto the joints and worse with rotation and side bending. So activities where you're looking up, uh, like if you're a painter or something like that, what you're going to notice is as you look up, these facet joints close down, and that's going to be why it becomes very painful for you. And so you can see here on this patient, as they look up, all these facet joints down low start to get compressed. And so if you have arthritis of the posterior column, this is going to hurt. So one of the main differences between the low back lecture we talked about and this one is that you have two different joints that can uh, develop arthritis in the neck as opposed to one in the back. So every joint uh, in your whole body consists of your bone, so a cartilaginous layer, a joint space, and then the cartilaginous layer and bone of the joint of the bone that is articulating with it. Now what happens over time is that that joint space decreases with the development of arthritis and then you start to grind the, the cartilage, but that cartilage does not have good nerve endings. So you really don't feel it until you start to get bare spots within the cartilage and that's very painful. And when you do that, you actually start to, as a, your body responds to bone contacting bone, you start making bone spurs and you can see little bone spurs here. And so these bone spurs are the body's attempt to try to protect itself from the joint banging, but all they end up doing is getting in the way. And so the discs, its secondary function, remember its primary function is a shock absorber, but its secondary function is actually to create this disc space. And so as these guys flatten out and you start losing uh, disc 
height, you also lose joint space and you start to develop arthritis. Now, if that was the end of the story, that'd be it. But unfortunately, uh, in the neck, you have this secondary joint called the uncovertebral joint that goes right alongside of the disc. And so just as you can press in with a bone spur from the facet and pinch a nerve, you can actually press backwards with the uncovertebral joint with a uh, bone spur and press nerve. So the neck, even though it gets less um, disc bulges, it tolerates the disc bulges worse because there's less space. Not only are you occupying a uh, space with a disc bulge, you're occupying space with the uncovertebral joint uh, spur as well as a facet spur. So uh, the necks don't tolerate particularly large disc bulges because of um, more pinch points within the neck. And so when we talk about facet pain, so posterior column pain syndrome, right? So when you look up, your joint arthritis can hurt in the neck, and it can hurt in the neck at the level where you have the arthritis, but it also has this very odd feature where it can refer to other places along your back and your arm, uh, depending on the, uh, the level at which you have the arthritis. And so people who come in with weird periscapular pain or pain around the scalp and things like that, if there's no definitive reason for it uh, and they have neck pain, it's likely the joint arthritis presenting as referred pain into the shoulders and, and uh, head. So your treatments for your facet arthritis are typically NSAIDs, which are effective. Uh, physical therapy, which can be effective at providing muscular, uh, flex both flexibility and strength to support these joints. And then you also have what's called the medial branch ablation. So uh, if NSAIDs and physical therapy are not enough, your joints are innervated by the medial branch nerve of the uh, nerve that feeds that distribution. And so if you were to have arthritis at this joint, the pain signal enters into the nerve and goes up to the brain to be interpreted as pain. And it happens at the level of and at the level above. And so when that happens, you send a pain signal to the brain to be interpreted as pain. So what we do if physical therapy and NSAIDs are not enough is we do a two-step process. It starts with a medial branch nerve block. So we inject a very small amount of anesthetic on those nerves and essentially numb the joint and let you walk around with it for a few hours. And if you have significant improvement of the pain you, you get when you look up or rotate your head, then we know that those are the levels where you're having the arthritic pain that is painful for you and disruptive to your life. We repeat that procedure once to make sure there's not a false positive. And if you have significant relief of your symptoms, we then follow it up with a radiofrequency ablation. And so this is a picture from uh, Stryker, who makes a Stryker RFA uh, uh, machine. This is not an advertisement for Stryker. There are other very good companies that also make it. It's just Stryker had the nicest pictures to show you. But this is a lumbar model, but we do a very, very similar procedure to the neck where we find the, the nerves. We uh, block them if the block is successful twice, and then we burn those nerves. And you can get between 6 and 24 months of relief. Most people get around 6 to 12 months of relief out of it. And we can't forget self-management, particularly in neck arthritis. Self-management can be very, very effective. Uh, in your low back, it's tough because the low back has to load the weight of the torso, but your neck only really has to uh, load the weight of your head. And so there's lots of self-management things you can do with ergonomics that can uh, help with your neck pain. So things like having your computer height high enough or your monitor for your computer high enough, where if you sit with proper posture, your eyeballs should be hitting mid screen. So if you're able to very easily look over your screen, you're probably uh, either sitting too high or your screen is too low. Um, you should be able to um, adjust your car mirrors, your car seat, all the different things. So you're not having to look down 
So if you're looking down is like the enemy of having uh, degenerating discs in your neck, because it's going to provide you significant pain. Sleep positioning, if you have a bad disc in your neck, sleeping propped up on too many pillows may put a bend in your neck that causes significant pain. Uh, prolonged smartphone use can be harmful to your neck if you have anterior column issues because you're looking down at a screen and it forces into flexion. Uh, behavioral health. Uh, so there are uh, pretty good studies that show that the more stressed you are, the more uh, the more tension you keep in your neck and shoulder muscles. So things like cognitive behavioral therapy to help manage stress and manage anxiety can be very helpful for neck pain. Uh, acceptance uh, therapy also uh, is another modality that behavioral health providers uh, use to uh, help manage your pain. There's also massage and foam rolling and heat. Uh, all of those guys are helpful, particularly for muscular uh, causes of neck pain. Sleep, we've talked about in uh, multiple other lectures where uh, getting sleep controlled is very, very important for uh, decreasing uh, your uh, your pain and increasing your pain thresholds. TENS units can be effective. Uh, they have mixed evidence for effect. Uh, they tend to work really well while you have it on, and, but the pain does tend to come back, but uh, it can be very helpful while on. Acupuncture and cupping also have uh, mixed evidence for effect. There are some red flags, and these kind of go for both your uh, your neck and your low back. So for uh, red flags, for if there is a tumor, there's several tumors or cancers within the body that metastasize to the spine, such as the lung, breast, and uh, multiple myeloma is actually a, a bone cancer. And so if you have tumor red flags, you're going to have things that uh, cause you to lose weight, cause you to have pain that wakes you out of sleep, um, unexplained fevers, unexplained, um, unexplained full body sweats. Uh, and so if you have red flags, you should be evaluated by your primary care doc and potentially imaged to make sure that there's no tumors present. Uh, infections. Yeah, there are folks who have had uh, spinal procedures or can have other illnesses that uh, result in a development of infection of the bone or an abscess uh, in the spine area. And these will be things like really bad fever, chills, stuff like that. There's also risk for fractures. So if you are a patient who has osteoporosis and you've had a fall, even a relatively minor fall, and you have really, really significant neck or back pain, there's always a question of whether or not you've had an osteoporotic um, fragility fracture. And so this should be evaluated. Uh, aneurysms. Uh, so aneurysms are interesting. So aneurysms within your chest or your aorta gives you pain that refers into your back. And so having an, uh, a thoracic aortic aneurysm or uh, can give you pain into your back or neck or an abdominal aortic aneurysm can give you pain into your back. And so for all, all the world, it feels like you're having back pain, but in reality, you're having uh, an aneurysm. So folks who have increased risk for aneurysms are going to be smokers, uh, particularly men over age 65, but it can also be females um, and folks with uh, significant hypertension. And so again, these are red flags. These are certainly not all encompassing and it can be present for both neck or back pain. And anytime any, uh, any of these guys are present, you should be visiting with your physician to determine your risk.